been a good couple weeks for stocks, but now they're having to deal with the market boogeyman again, which is the bond market selling off pretty hard after retail sales beat expectations. Last week's inflation numbers also came in warm, and Rob Arnott, the last time we talked to him, told us that that story was far from over. He's founder and chairman of the Board of Research Affiliates. Rob, great to have you again this morning. Good to see you. Great to see you. Appreciate that. So let's talk about the data here the last uh, week, because when we last spoke, you said, look, yeah, inflation's cooled off but it is more about disinflation, not deflation, and still might have some surprises in store for us. Tell me what you think of what we saw here from the economy the past week. Well, <clears throat> it's not just the economy, it's the uh, geopolitical landscape. Uh, war is almost never a good thing when it comes to inflation. It creates uh, serious inflationary risks. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the inflation numbers, the uh, inflation between now and year end that we are replacing from last year was for all intents and purposes, zero inflation. And so that means that the coming quarter, unless we have zero inflation, the reported numbers, the year over year numbers will rise. And I find it fascinating that so few people look back at the months that we're replacing, because we don't know what October is going to come in at, but we know what the month of October last year looked like. And that change is what drives the movement in the rolling 12-month uh, inflation numbers. So infl the inflation story is far from over. Um, it doesn't mean that we're going to see new highs in inflation. but. Frankly, I wouldn't rule that out with the geopolitical landscape in particular, because uh, war in a resource-rich region of the world uh, could lead to attacks on pipelines. It could lead to all sorts of dislocations. I had a conversation with an investor yesterday, and um, I was Dan Niles, and I asked him, what is the main metric or asset that he watches to determine his macro view. And he said without hesitation, crude oil. You tell me where crude is, and that's how I'm essentially, I'm paraphrasing here, but that's essentially going to be one of the primary factors in his decision making. How do you feel about that? I mean, I know that with all the quantitative work you do about factors and valuations, does it make sense to distill our macro situation right now basically down to a crude oil commodity linked to inflation? No, I, I think crude is um, one of the most volatile components of inflation mm. and certainly a key driver, but I wouldn't boil it down to the single metric. Um, I do think that there's a wide, wide range of components to inflation. I also think the macroeconomic backdrop is an interesting one. Um, we've, we have a government that created inflation and we're looking to that same government to fix inflation. We have a government that uh, created the uh, free money that laid the stage for a lot of resource malinvestment, misallocation of resources, propping up of zombie businesses. And we're looking to that same set of entities, notably the Fed, to fix that set of problems. So I think there's, there's some uh, danger lurking ahead. Now, that danger doesn't necessarily mean a recession, although I think there's uh, 50 50 odds of a recession next year. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's a uh, high likelihood of a bear market, although, once again, I think a 50 50 likelihood next year is um, about right. In most years, you'd be looking at a 20% risk of uh, recession or bear market, and I'd say 50% uh, in the year ahead. Hmm. So I look at the uh, economic backdrop and see headwinds there too. Uh, no recession has ever started from a vantage point of an economy that wasn't booming. And mm. so the booming economy is a uh, small comfort. The fact that there's two job openings for every job seeker is a stronger data point that suggests that uh, a recession might be averted. Uh, Rudy Dornbush, famous MIT economist in the 1990s, famously said, no economic expansion dies of old age. They're murdered by the Fed. Mm -hmm. And this is where we're at the moment where this higher for longer seems to be uh, an interesting gambit that uh, we're, we're going through because those higher rates should suck out some of the liquidity and froth that has been aiding those zombie companies that you talk about. But at the same time, uh, it seems like they're not killing that 
economic bounce we're getting, this sort of trampoline landing the last uh, four or five months, Rob, where the numbers keep beating expectations. I'm curious what you've seen in the market leadership and the dynamics of which sectors, styles, have been connected to this better than expected economy. Have the groups led that you would think would lead if I told you four months ago we were going to be printing 300,000 NFP numbers and ISMs back above 50. Is the market trading like that type of cyclical bounce we've gotten? Um, I would have been a, a little surprised at the continued tech leadership. The tech market, tech side of the market looks awfully frothy to me. Um, we've seen a spread in valuations between growth stocks, um, uh, the FANG plus stocks, and the, the mainstream economy. That spread, uh, reached an all-time peak in August of 2020. It tested that peak again in uh, late 2021. It's tested it again this past summer. And so we're looking at a spread between growth and value that is uh, essentially without precedent. And that spread basically says these growth stocks are gonna utterly dominate the economy in the decades ahead and the value stocks are toast. Well. Empirically, the value companies are doing fine. They aren't growing as fast as the growth segments of the market. Of course, they don't. But uh, collectively, as businesses, they're doing fine. And the implication of that is that the market is very likely uh, in the midst of another tech bubble. Mm. The um trade that uh, is so fascinating to me is the way the market seems to trade the big tech as safety. I've always kind of doubted this notion, but it feels like over the last six, seven months uh, that there's some growing validity to it. I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you feel that way at all, Rob, that some of these companies with their huge cash piles, I'm not necessarily talking to Tesla or, or Netflix, but um, a uh, Apple, and NVIDIA, maybe even an Amazon that is uh, connected to the retail consumer now? I mean, is there some uh, quality factor embedded in these that truly allows them to operate as safety? Um, as an investor, we should always look for our margin of safety. As a business manager, you should always look for your margin of safety. As businesses, these have a margin of safety. Their profit levels are tremendous. Their cash reserves are tremendous. As stocks, they don't have a margin of safety. They're priced for perfection. Yeah. That's always dangerous. And so I look on this as another extraordinary opportunity to pivot back into value. And those who are underexposed to value, if there's a bear market, are likely to be very disappointed because the tech segments of the market, the FANG plus stocks, have loads of downside risk. The upside has been stupendous, but that upside has not been accompanied by growth in business commensurate with the growth in share values. And the result is that the downside risk is real. Look to your margin of safety. We developed fundamental index back in 2003 and four, and fundamental index represents a, an extraordinary way to gain access to value. I think that's an interesting way to phrase it, the margin of risk, right? For the businesses, we can be pretty confident Apple and NVIDIA are gonna be around for a very, very long time. But whether or not they trade yeah. at those valuations they've achieved is a very different story from an investment standpoint. Are there any areas or pockets of the market that stand out to you in your value analysis that do look like uh, places that have become obvious buys at this point? You know, the market has become so concentrated. Uh, you have to go back to the 1960s to find the top five stocks in the market as large a percentage of the stock market as, as it is the case today. Yeah. Um, history also tells us that the companies in that top tier, if you look at the top 10 in market capitalization decade by decade, on average, two or three are still on the list 10 years later. So which two or, two or three of today's top 10 will still be on that list 10 years from now? I would be reluctant to guess, but I sure would want to fade those. Um, as for the rest of the market, uh, the market is so concentrated that it's almost an anything but the FANG Plus opportunity set. Also anything but US. 
because the U.S. stock market is priced at mm, ballpark of a 50% premium on uh, price earnings, price to sales, uh, price to dividends relative to the rest of the world, both developed ex-U.S. and the emerging economies of the world are comparatively cheap. Yeah, love the international point uh, as well. Rob, before we let you go, uh, back home here for a sec because we've got earnings season coming up. Can you give us any pointers as everyday investors, what we should look for as like red or yellow flags in an environment like the AI trade, which I see as you write is going to be transformative and a big deal, but probably in a bubble too. How will we, yeah. what are the red flags bubbly stocks give off early in their stages? Well, the, late, the, the, uh, we we wrote a paper uh, uh, just a few weeks ago called the AI Nvidia um, uh, uh, Singularity Breakthrough Bubble or Both, and the the takeaway is it's both. It's a breakthrough. It's going to massively change the world. It's one in a long, long, long series of breakthroughs. Whether you're talking railroads or uh, planes or radio or TV or computers or internet. This is one in a long series of transformative technological innovations. They're going to massively change the world. But as is the case in so many of these transformative circumstances, the beneficiary is the customer. The shareholder is a secondary beneficiary, if that, because <laughs> the stocks tend to be priced for perfection. Great stuff. Uh, love it. Rob Arnott, thanks a lot for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Like the delineation between the shareholder and the consumer and the customer. Rob Arnott from Research Affiliates.